and I want to welcome everybody for being here. This is the very first public lecture uh, sponsored by the Conceptual Foundations for Conflict Project at USC. The Conceptual Foundations for uh, Conflict Project is a new thing at USC. We've started in the last year and our goal is to promote and support uh, work in the exchange of ideas that bring philosophy to bear. I'm thinking about the nature, sources, structure, and dynamics of conflict. I think there's all kinds of cool work here to be done, and there are great people who are already doing it. And sometimes that work is not always categorized as all having the intellectual connections to each other that I think it has because it comes from many different areas of philosophy. And one of the things that we hope to do as part of the project is to uh, encourage public access of a lot of this work. And I think there is uh, um, uh, nobody who has been doing such cool work that I think bears on the topic of the project or as much work to bring that work to public attention as Regina Rini, who's gonna join us today. I know that some of you have been reading her work in classes and we're all very excited to have her. So everybody join me in welcoming with quiet applause uh, uh, Regina Rini. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate being invited to do this. I'm really honored to be doing uh, the inaugural lecture for the project, which sounds like a really, really great uh, project. Um, and I'm, uh, let's see, I'm going to have to, in a second, I'm going to have to figure out how to make this thing share my PowerPoint, which I will do in just a second. But actually, let's try to do it right now. Okay, let's find out. Is it working? Yes, it is. Okay, all right, good. That was, that was the hardest part of the whole thing was to make sure that this actually happens. Okay, good. So um, I'm gonna be talking about good faith debate. And the reason why I'm gonna do that is because it's obviously in the air right now. There was a presidential debate last week in the United States. People are debating on social media right now about political topics. People are also debating the pandemic and questions about what good public policy measures are or how much responsibility to take personally or individually when going out in public, you know, about masks and that sort of thing. People are debating it all the time. And if you're on social media, of course, you are aware that there's often a debate about the debate, which is, are you a troll? Are you here just to cause trouble? Are you arguing in good faith? And what's interesting is that we have this concept of good faith debate, but it's actually not, as far as I can tell, thought through very closely by that many people. And so this paper, and I, I should be clear, this is the first time I'm giving this. This only exists as like notes and this PowerPoint. I like to give talks for the first time by talking them out and getting ideas back and then revising. So literally you're seeing everything I've got on this so far. And I'll be really interested to hear your feedback. So I'm trying to think through this concept of good faith and then use it to diagnose what's gone wrong with social media. So here's the plan for the talk. First, I'm gonna motivate it. Why should we care about this concept of good faith? Why not just rely on other concepts? Then I'm going to propose various ways of thinking about what good faith debate could be. And I'm gonna show problems with each of them. And those problems will guide us into thinking about a conceptual space for what kind of, what, what good faith would have to be. Then I'm gonna propose a model, like I'm gonna call the cooperation model, which is an attempt to accommodate all those problems and also give a positive account for what good faith could be. And then finally, in the last few minutes, I'm gonna come back to talking about the internet and I'm gonna to try to diagnose some of our main problems in internet culture using this model of cooperation. Okay, that's the plan. So why talk about good faith? The obvious question here is why not talk about truth instead? Why not talk about truth given how much we're talking about fake news and alternative facts and a post-truth society? That's the thing that's in the air right now. And I've written some stuff about that myself. So why not, why not just talk about whether you're being truthful or not? Well, the worry I have here is that we're crowding out other conceptual tools when we think solely in terms of truth, right? So the idea here is that here's a bunch of people chatting, they're saying different things, they're uttering different comments in the public discourse. And on the, on the truth-related model, what we're worried about is what the correspondence is between each of their statements and the truthful facts of matter. I'm not assuming any fancy philosophical conceptions of the nature of truth here. This is meant to be just pure theoretic and intuitive. Truth has something to do with is what you're saying in some sort of correspondence relationship to the facts, or is there some sort of important truth conducive relationship? Doesn't matter, your, your philosophical views and the nature of truth aren't super important to this point. So that's one way of thinking about what public debate is about. But there's a whole other conceptual toolbox that philosophers have for thinking about public debate. And that's coming from the domain of ethics. So we can think about 
a moral respect between equal agents, respect of each other as co-citizens, as moral agents, as democratic participants, as um, epistemic agents. There are lots of ways of thinking about each other along moral terms. And these two conceptual toolboxes, the truth one and the respect one, don't always go together. It is possible to be disrespectful, but truthful. It is possible to be respectful, but untruthful, etc. These things don't perfectly match. And what I think it becomes clear when we think about this for a little bit longer is that the concept of good faith doesn't cleanly fit in either of these toolboxes. It's borrowing tools from each of the toolboxes and mingling them in complicated ways, uh, what we'll see as we go. And so I think that we need to work to articulate what is this complicated hybrid concept. Good faith involves some relationship to truth or facts, and that relationship is going to get complicated as we go, but it also involves an interpersonal or moral element that I'm going to call the respect category. Okay, so that's why we should think about good faith. We should also think about good faith because it's what's at stake in a lot of our fights about trolls on the internet and other such phenomena. Trolls aren't arguing good faith. They're often here just to annoy us, just to cause trouble. They aren't really here to have an honest, respectful, truthful discussion. There's also the phenomenon of dunking. Dunking is a Twitter thing. If you're not on Twitter, you've probably been spared this. But on Twitter, what you do is you quote, retweet another person so you, you, you reproduce their tweet in your timeline, but then you could caption it above it. And then the caption, you write something funny about how stupid and evil this person is. And then all of your followers enjoy your dunking on this person and showing how stupid and evil they are. And notice this is probably not a good faith debate either. You're not actually trying to have a discussion with the person you're dunking on. You're, you're, not, you're not even necessarily trying to persuade anyone. You're just trying to show off. Okay, and then finally, we have this problem of bots. Bots are these simple, uh, programmed, automated language systems that emit comments into public debate. Some of them operate out of St. Petersburg and out of Russian intelligence. Some of them are just weird people's projects to mess around with people on the internet, but they're not even capable. They're, they're very simple programs. They don't have mental states. They're not engaged in good faith, sincere debate with people. And so we, we wanna be able to diagnose what's going wrong there. So part of the goal here is to have a framework that allows us to theorize what's gone wrong with all of these different things social media does. Further, this is now coming to the, the other, the moral theory side of the, of the toolbox, the moral theory toolbox. I've argued before that moral persuasion is an important category. I've argued that persuasion is a, a, a expression of moral respect between moral equals. It's a way that we relate to one another in what philosophers often talk about as the space of reasons that is not through threats, not through like trying to pay you bribes, not through other incentives, but through I give you reasons and you evaluate the reasons and we give reasons back and forth. And that practice is a respectful practice. So I, we want to keep in, in play this notion of persuasion as a morally respectful practice. Uh, what I'm trying to give you right now is some of the philosophical motivation. Like if you came into this talk saying, I don't ever go on social media, what do I care about good faith? Right now I'm trying to show you how this is grounded in philosophical concepts. So why philosophers or people who care about philosophy should care about this. So a second set of topics from philosophy has to do with the, the legitimacy of democracy. A lot of conventional, a lot of contemporary theories about why democracy is legitimate have to do with public discourse. Jürgen Habermas famously articulated a, a discourse ethics for democratic, disco, dis, democratic discourse. But what makes democracy legitimate is that it's this open sharing in a respectful, equal way of our alternative points of view uh, in, in lots of complicated conditions but under what, what counts as legitimate. But the idea is democracy's legitimacy derives in part from that sharing of perspectives. More recently, the um, French-American political theorist Helen Landemar has articulated a view about the value of democracy in terms of pluralistic decision-making being the best way to solve problems. It's a kind of an, a, a instrumental claim about what democracy is really good at doing. Okay, and these are, I have, I have a whole project I'm working on right now about thinking through these different ways of understanding democratic legitimacy, but what they both presuppose is that there is some conception of good faith debate that underlies what drives the legitimacy of democracy. Okay, one final philosophical project that intersects what I'm going to talk about is the concept of trust. And here I'm borrowing the particular concept of trust from Annette Beyer. If you've never read Beyer's work on trust, I really recommend it. It's really perceptive. And Bayer has this conception of trust as being um, an attitude of expecting other people to have an attitude of caring toward things that you have, you care about and that you vouchsafe to them. That's a bit of a simple, simplified version, but roughly it's, it's expecting a certain attitude from the people you engage with. Um, and what I think this is important is that in the context of mistakes and disagreement, like in public policy debates, say about COVID, 
we have to expect that when people screw up, they still care about the thing we mutually care about with them, whether it's figuring out the truth about COVID, figuring out the best way the government should be formulated, that sort of thing. So in other words, we have to have an attitude that mistakes are evidence of somebody still being trustworthy, even if we think they're wrong. And that's the key point here. That's what good faith debate is about. Do we have some attitude that allows us to say you are wrong, but you are still arguing in good faith? Okay, can I still trust you? All right, so so far all I've done is articulated a bunch of concepts floating in the vicinity. I still haven't told you what good faith debate is, but I hope you're convinced at this point that it's important we find some sort of answer. Okay, so now I'm gonna try to give you ways of articulating what good faith debate is supposed to be, part two of the talk. And just to warn you, this is gonna be a flurry of proposals and they're all gonna go down one by one. It's like you have some old action movie where all the villains start running at us and we're just gonna knock them down one at a time. That's what's gonna happen, it's a bunch of them. But the pattern, I think, over time will build up um, the, the resources we need to see what a good account is gonna be, okay? So here's the first obvious one, good faith debate a good faith debater sincerely aims at discovering the truth. This is the simple truth-seeking model. It might be the most intuitive one. If you started off this talk initially thinking this was just gonna be about fake news and that sort of stuff, this is the thing that you might expect where we'd go, right? A good faith debater aims to get at the truth. This rules out obviously things like trolls who don't actually care about the truth. It probably rules out bots. It, it might rule out some forms of dunking. It might rule out lots of different bad, bad faith practices. So this seems like a plausible view, at least at first blush. There are problems though. One of them is this. What do we wanna say about debate about non-factual topics? Like for example, the red hot chili peppers, good music or bad music, right? I take it we can have good faith debate about that even if we don't think musical aesthetics is a factual domain. Now I'm not taking a position here on whether it is. Maybe you think that there are facts about musical aesthetics. I'm not, I'm not trying to argue with you about that. My point is people who don't think that, people who agree there are no facts about musical appreciation. There's no facts about whether it's good or bad. Can still have a debate about whether the Red Hot Chili Peppers are good, and it can still be a good faith debate, even though the purpose of their debate is not truth seeking. Okay? If you're not convinced by the Red Hot Chili Peppers, think about Presidential Fight Club, which is an internet thing that's been going on for about a decade. It goes back to McSweeney's piece from 2010, which is imagine all of the US presidents like were plucked out of history at their physical prime and thrown into a battle royale on, a, on an island where they had to fight to the death, right? Who would win? And people argue, is it, is it, is it Teddy Roosevelt? Is it Andrew Jackson, et cetera? And people get really into this. Like, look this up later. There's like, like half a dozen websites and a bunch of Reddit forums about this. They get into this. They argue, I take it in good faith. Yet, I doubt many of them think there's a fact of the matter about this. I don't even know what kind of fact it would be about who's going to win this battle royale. Uh, I, I take it you can have a good faith argument about presidential fight club, even if you don't think there are actually facts that you're aiming at discovering. And also importantly, I think you can have a bad faith debate about presidential fight club. You can engage in, in debate about presidential fight club that's mostly intended to make the other person look silly. You can, I, it's not actually aimed at whatever the goals are of arguing about presidential fight club, okay? So we'll come back to what the goals might be in a little bit. But the point for now is just that these examples, I think, push against a simple truth-seeking model because it looks like we can have good faith debate about domains that the debaters don't think is truth conducive. There's another problem with good faith, the, the, the truth-seeking model, and it has to do with manipulative zealots. A manipulative zealot is somebody who is sincerely trying to get at the truth. They are seeking the truth and they want you to believe the truth too, and they don't care how they get you there. They're gonna use any rhetorical techniques they need. They're gonna talk quickly. They're going to introduce misleading evidence. They are going to bully you if you ever slip up. They're going to exploit the fact if you say you have a stutter and you can't speak fluidly under certain circumstances, they will exploit that. They're going to do anything they can to get you to believe what is true according to them. And what's important here is they are truth seeking, let's grant, and their motivations are all about seeking truth, but their techniques are very much not in good faith. In fact, they're signally not in good faith. So the truth-seeking model seems insufficient because it doesn't account for these interpersonal aspects of how they're relating. So let's try a different model. This is coming from the other side now. This is coming from the other toolbox, the moral theory side, the persuasive model. A good faith debater sincerely aims to persuade their interlocutor. So we're not worrying right now about whether we're ultimately we're getting a truth. It's just that the motivations are to change somebody's beliefs. And again, notice that this does rule out things like trolls. Trolls aren't necessarily there to convince you to change your beliefs. They're there just to cause trouble. So this would rule out a lot of things like trolling, et cetera. Uh, however, it's also prey 
to the problem of manipulative zealots. It depends here on how we understand the word persuasion. If we take persuasion to be a really, really robust term that has like lots of conditions and you can't engage in any sort of uh, manipulation to count as being persuasive, et cetera, et cetera, you could rule out this problem. But I don't want to put all of that heavy work on this one verb that in itself isn't super well defined or well understood in, in, um, in people, among the people we're talking to. So I take it that um, at least the conventional English usage of persuade, it is possible for a manipulative zealot to manipulatively persuade someone. And yet that wouldn't count as good faith debate, I think if you trick somebody into being persuaded into something through techniques that they themselves would reject if they understood what you were doing, that doesn't count as good faith debate. So it looks like this persuasive model is too simplistic as well. It needs some more complicated maneuver to be able to account for manipulative zealots. So here's another model, the ideal interlocutor model. This might've already occurred to a lot of philosophers. A good faith debater sincerely aims to persuade an ideal interlocutor. That is, you're trying to convince somebody to change their mind, but it's not the person who you can manipulate with, with, uh, with bullying and foibles. It's someone who thinks very clearly and, and, and cleanly about a topic. And would you be able, was what you're doing right now something that would persuade such a person? Okay. In other words, if you can trick the person you're actually sitting across the table from, that's not good enough to count as being in good faith debate. However, there's a problem with this as well, which is that this account seems to rule out some realities of how real world debates work. In fact, it rules out fallible interlocutor interactions. As an example, suppose I'm debating mathematics with Mario Mirzakhani, who was a winner of the Fields Prize. And unfortunately, she died a few years ago, quite young. But imagine before she died, I had gone and had an argument with her about some complicated thing in mathematics, something really complicated. And she was trying to persuade me that I was wrong about my views. And in fact, I, mean, I don't know that much about mathematics. So if she tried to persuade me as if I were an ideal interlocutor who could think clearly about this domain, who understood everything, there's one approach she'd take. And there's a different approach she's gonna take for a, a someone like me who's someone limited in this domain. She's gonna dumb it down. She's gonna simplify some points. She might say some things that are strictly speaking not exactly true because the truth is too complicated for me to follow because I don't understand the domain very well. But the simplifications are necessary. The motivations she has in this story are good. She's trying to help me to see something, but she's not gonna to talk to me as if I'm an ideal interlocutor because I'm not, I'm actually fallible. And yet the ideal interlocutor model is getting something wrong here because it suggests that when she dumbs it down and speaks to me in a way that um, is not, uh, ideal that she's not behaving in good faith. And that seems wrong. It seems signally that she is behaving in good faith by in fact, adapting to what she, adapting what she's saying to me. Okay. So it looks like the ideal interlocutor model is kind of too strong in a certain way. It's demanding too much from good faith debate. So let's do another one. Remember I promised you these are just going to fall down one by one. Here's another one. Uh, we go the transparent persuasion model, a good faith debater, sincerely aims to persuade an interlocutor via means that the interlocutor can thoughtfully accept. You can kind of see how this is an attempt to, uh, to fix the problem of the last one, rather than postulate some hypothetical ideal interlocutor who's not problem, has any kind of problems. We take the actual person you're talking to and imagine a version of them that is much more thoughtful to what you're doing, has the time, has the patience to look carefully at the arguments you're giving. And can that person approve of the means you are using to try to persuade them, okay? So in other words, we imagine a sli slightly idealized second order version of your interlocutor. This is a very familiar move. Lots of philosophers make this kind of move when thinking about moral relationships. And that this is a promising way of thinking, but this is also prey to a certain different sort of problem. And this is, I think, is gonna introduce a complication here. The notion of debate it has a problem with adversarial demonstration a term I'm gonna to use to refer to a certain type of debate. So a, a canonical example of this was a debate that took place in October of 1961 between Malcolm X and Bayard Rustin, another civil rights leader of the 1960s era. In fact, it took place almost exactly 59, weeks, 59 years ago. It was this week, 59 years ago. It took place at Howard University. And the topic of the debate was separation or integration, how to handle uh, racial justice in the United States in the 1960s. With Malcolm X obviously taking a more black national separation side and Bayard Rustin who was a close associate of um, Martin Luther King Jr. had a much more familiar, moderate integrationist position. Now, what's important about this debate is that neither of the participants thought there was any chance of persuading the other. They both went into it knowing the other one was pretty set in their position and was not going to change their mind, okay? So in other words, they weren't trying to achieve the transparent persuasion model. 
they weren't trying they weren't expecting it was even possible that like a thoughtful version of the other person would approve of the methods they were using it didn't matter that wasn't relevant because what they were trying to do was persuade the audience this was taking place on a stage in front of an audience at howard and in fact i, I learned about this from the book the sword and the shield by peniel joseph the book documents how a bunch of the people who were there who were like who went on to be leaders of the civil rights movement in the 60s and 70s found that that debate catalyzed their thinking several people switched to malcolm x's side of this debate as a result of that discussion some were more convinced of Rustin's side it doesn't really matter where people wound up the point is that the exchange was useful this adversarial demonstration was useful and it accomplished the goal of these two speakers in fact the, uh, this book sword in the shield describes how they became friends they became to respect each other they never changed their minds not, not as a result of this that's not quite true. They, they shifted their positions a bit, but the fundamental question they still disagreed about. And in fact, they took the show on the road. They went and had this debate again and again in front of different audiences, uh, in front of uh, different black audiences up and down uh, the US East Coast. And so here's the point. According to the transparent persuasion model, this shouldn't count as good faith debate because the way they're interacting with each other isn't about trying to persuade the other person to change their minds. It's about talking to the audience instead. And yet, I take it this is a canonical example of good faith debate as well, even though it isn't trying to persuade the interlocutor. So one more model that's also going to get knocked down, but one last one, which is attempting to account for that. The audience persuasion model. You, you probably guessed that's where I was going. A good faith debater sincerely aims to persuade some audience via means that this audience can thoughtfully accept. In other words, we take the, the, um, the thought, the persuasion, the thought persuasion model and meld it with this point about audiences. And then we allow an audience might include your interlocutor. Sometimes it does, and then you're trying to persuade the person you're talking to, but not always. Maybe you're talking to the audience at Howard University. And so you're trying to persuade the audience via some means that they can thoughtfully accept. Okay, this, this is getting more complicated. Looks like a pretty robust definition, but there are still some problems. Has a problem with what I call cynical puppeteering. And this happens when people use their debate partner in a way that is disrespectful to the debate partner in order to get at some audience. Here's an example from several days ago. During the last debate between, between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, they were debating the Paris Accords, the climate change accords, and the debate was about why Donald Trump pulled the United States out of the accords. And Trump claimed that this was because it was unfair because China, according to the accords, has more years to reduce its emissions than the United States does. China gets a couple, like another extra decade or so to reduce its emissions to the same level as the US. And Trump was suggesting this was unfair and Biden's in China's pocket, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what's interesting about this is if you know the details here, you know what the rejoinder should be. The rejoinder is, well, look, there's a reason why it's structured that way, which is that China industrialized later than the West. And if you add up the total amount of emissions over time and the total economic development, it's just still true that the United States and Western Europe have already benefited from emissions more than China has, and this is balancing the scale, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a bunch of good responses to explain why China should have a different standard than the US. But of course, Biden didn't give that answer because he knew if you say that on national television during a debate where you get 15 seconds, maybe less before Trump starts talking over you, you can't explain all that. Trump was expecting that, I think, and was prepared to um, to make, a, make, make hay out of it and say, oh, Biden's just making excuses for China. Biden's in China's pocket, et cetera, et cetera. So Biden didn't give that response. He didn't give the, the, the thoughtful response to this point. He instead shifted to try to avoid the discussion entirely. Now, I'm giving this as an example because it looks like what Trump did in that debate ought to count as good faith debate according to the audience persuasion model. Remember, the point is not to persuade Joe Biden, it's to persuade some set of the audience according to means they can thoughtfully accept. Not everybody can thoughtfully accept that game about China, but some people in the audience do, even if they, understand, even if they hear both of the sides I just gave you, right? The point is that the goal is to, is to get them by their own lights. There are some people in the audience who will accept the kind of move Donald Trump made as a good way of coming to a conclusion. And the goal is to get them to come on to side, even if, it, even if it's not a very fair way of treating the person you're debating with. But I take it that last point, the sort of uh, manipulative way that Trump set up that exchange with Biden is a signal case of not a good faith debate. Because Trump was involved in this, um, um, this, uh, this interesting, um, Man this is maneuver to try to avoid um, uh, uh, the point, the rejoinder that Biden could have made. This doesn't count as good faith debate. And yet the, the account on the table suggests that it should. So we need an account that rules out cynical puppeteering, okay? 
So I'm just going to quickly review for you all the problems we've seen so far. And the way I'm going to review it is by looking how each of the models put certain cases in the wrong column, right? Does the model count this as a case of good faith debate? So think again about non-factual topics. The truth-seeking model suggests that debates about music or presidential fight club can't be good faith debates since they're not truth-oriented. That seems like a mistake. Manipulative zealots, both the truth-seeking model and the persuasive model, the simple persuasive model, seem to count manipulative zealots as good faith debaters because they're either aimed at truth or they're aimed at persuading. We saw that that seems like a mistake. That shouldn't count. The problem of accommodating fallible interlocutors, it looks like dumbing down or trying to address the limitations of your audience counts as not good faith debate on this account, but that seems like a mistake. It seems like good faith debate involves such things as dumbing down or addressing your actual interlocutors. We also saw the problem of adversarial demonstration. We need to be able to explain how speaking to um, the audience and not just the person you're debating with can still count as good faith debate, even though the transparent persuasion model doesn't allow for that. It seems to count that as not good faith debate. And finally, we saw that the audience persuasion model seems to count as good faith debate, cynical puppeteering, where you mistreat or you, you treat unfairly the person you're engaged in a public debate with in order to be persuasive to some audience. You just treat your debate partners as a kind of mere means to some a, a communicative message you're trying to pass on. Okay, so that's the range of different problems we have. And these different accounts that I've considered, which have gotten increasingly more sophisticated, each have problems with one or the other of them. So I'm gonna suggest now that the way to handle all of these problems, the best way to think about good faith is to pull back a bit, to zoom back out, and instead think about these, this relationship between truth and respect and understand good faith as this mixture of different conceptual tools. And what that's gonna mean is that the model I'm about to give you now, the one that I'm actually endorsing, is gonna be really complicated. I mean, it's gonna have lots of pieces. It's not meant to be like a simple, easy, analytic thing. Um, so here it is, a good faith debater aims to participate in a shared project of sincere, cooperative, adversarial persuasion. And all of those elements are gonna matter. So let me walk through with you those different elements, and then I'm gonna show you how this account deals with all the problems we've hit already. So to say that the project we're talking about is sincere is to say that people actually say what they believe. They're not engaged in trolling. They're not engaged in devil's advocacy. They're just telling you what they actually believe. They really want, they really want to convince someone else of something. And in fact, it's genuine persuasion, which is aimed at changing other people's views, changing the views of those they disagree with. That's part of the goal is to persuade somebody. Again, it's not just to troll. So far, those are the easy points. We got those right away from the earlier accounts. Here's where it gets more distinctive. The key claim here I wanna make is that good faith debate is a cooperative joint project that is aimed at some further goal. So each individual participant in the project has the intermediate goal of persuading the other person of something. However, that individual project is a subset of some bigger project. In canonical examples, it's gonna be figuring out the facts. Like in, very, in, in the kind of examples we usually think about, this is where all the truth talk gets in. Usually what we're trying to do in debate is figure out the facts, figure out the truth. Although, as I've stressed, that's not always true. Sometimes where facts are in this diagram, something else should go there. Whatever it is you're trying to do when you want to have an argument at a presidential fight club, you're having some fun, you're, you're enjoying um, retrieving interesting, weird facts about Andrew Jackson, whatever it is you're doing, there's some other project that is making your, uh, your joint venture cooperative. You, you are still engaged in debate, but it is a debate where you share some joint, some joint project. And further, importantly, it's adversarial. And this, this might it'd be easy to leave this out, except this is what makes it a debate. Like there are other forms of joint epistemic projects that, that fit, all, fit, all, fit all of the other criteria, but they're not debates. This is adversarial in the sense people are disagreeing. The debate, disagreement is genuine. The disagreement is not a mock disagreement. It's not just to have fun about showing off your fighting abilities. You really do disagree and it really does matter that you um, successfully persuade somebody that you are right. And this adversarial element is really important to keeping, the, keeping this, this dynamic honest, which we'll see in just a second. Okay, so that's the model. Now let me talk through how it handles the problems we've been thinking about. The way to think about this, I have to just give you a little bit more framing. The way to think about this is that the adjectives I gave you, sincere, cooperative, adversarial, and now persuasion, these are words characterizing the practice. Good faith debate, or the good faith debater is somebody engaged in that practice. So the way to test whether something counts as good faith debate is to ask if a person were motivated by this kind of project, sincere, cooperative, adversarial persuasion, would they do that kind of thing? 
if such a person would not do that kind of thing to be participate in such a project, they don't count. That's the rough idea, okay? All right, so back to problem one. How does this account deal with non-factual topics? Well, again, remember, I already stressed this, since the point is that it's a cooperative adversarial project, it might be aimed at truth, but it might be aimed at something else. If we're, if we're arguing about music, it might be aimed at music appreciation or musical expression. It might be aimed at just introducing people to neglected artists we haven't talked about before. Or a presidential fight club may be aimed at fun under certain restrictions about how we get to argue. It's a fun type of argument or whatever. Anyway, I don't know exactly why people argue about presidential fight club, but the point here is just that it doesn't have to be truth oriented. The account doesn't build that in. Although again, canonical cases usually will be about trying to figure out the truth of something. Problem two, manipulative zealots. Well, they get ruled out. Correct. The account correctly points out manipulative zealots are not engaged in cooperation. They're not engaged in um, in persuasion usually, or uh, they might be engaged in persuasion, but they might not, they might be doing something else. Um, and they might not even be engaged in the right sort of adversarial exchange because a manipulative zealot may not be listening to the other person at all. Adversarial requires there's a back and forth. And if I'm a manipulative zealot, I might just be ignoring what you say, not even considering it. And so I might not count as even engaged in a true adversarial exchange. So I take it that the, like it's pretty easy to rule out manipulative zealots on this account, which, you know, pretty cheap to do when I've thrown in a bunch of different properties into this one account. The more interesting stuff is going to come from the next moves. So this explains the problem of fallible interlocutors. When Maria Mirzakhani wants to explain complicated mathematics to me, she wants to, to debate me about mathematics, she's, she indulges in debating me about mathematics, we're engaged in a cooperative project of persuasion and part of the cooperation is going to require some allowance for my limitations in debating high level mathematics. And so the, the goal of our exchange, the implicit goal that comes out as we talk, is having this debate in a way that's accessible to both of us and is governed by truth, mathematical truth, figuring out the truths of math, but restricted in certain ways that accommodate my non, uh, my non ideal capacity as a mathematical discussant. It's the, the, the cooperative element of the debate partly limits the extent of the complexity of the things that Mario Mizakani can say to me. Okay, so it correctly counts what she's doing and dumbing down for me as being good faith debate. Problem four. Well, I think this account nicely handles adversarial demonstration. When Bayer Rustin and Malcolm X are debating in front of, um, in front of Howard, uh, what they're doing is they're engaged in a cooperative, persuasive, adversarial project, even though they're not trying to persuade each other. They're engaged in a project that's aimed at persuading the audience. Each of them is separately trying to persuade the audience of something, of something else. But the point is that they are sharing together a joint project of giving a demonstration of, the, of their views, right? And in, in, in persuading the audience of the merits. And you might even think like the most high-minded version of this, which I think is true of this case, won't often be true in the real world, in, in, the, in the modern world among real people in, a, in a, um, social media, but it, it was true in this case in 1961, I think, um, is that what, what they were trying to do really was to draw out the nature of their disagreement, to help the audience see it, okay? And so that's the joint project, is to help the audience see what the stakes are and make up their own minds. Okay, finally, how does this account deal with, how does it rule out cynical puppeteering? Well, remember, the account requires that this be sincere and cooperative. That is, the people involved have to, in a sense, be, say, be, be truthfully stating what they believe, and they have to have, at least implicitly, some ground rules for what kind of joint project they're engaged in. And I take it, when you engage in cynical puppeteering of the type Trump did with Biden, a type you often get in bad faith debates, you are, you are going outside of the cooperative venture that's available. In fact, I think presidential debates are really bad examples because they're generally not cooperative ventures. They're almost, almost categorically are not good faith debates because the two people up there are not actually trying to have an honest exchange of views. They're both trying, basically, I forgot who said it, but presidential debates are usually um, like joint press appearances. They're not really meant to be a debate. Okay, but Trump is a really clear case, I think, where what he was engaged in was not meant to be a form of sincere cooperative venture with Biden. And so this is gonna get ruled out as well, okay? Now, let me also quickly talk about the way in which, this will be pretty obvious, the way in which internet phenomena are also shown by this account to be in trouble. So trolls, trolls are not sincere, they're not cooperative, they're often not engaged in persuasion, they are adversarial but they're not gonna meet most of the criteria in this. So that's gonna be pretty easy to explain how trolls don't count as engaged in good faith debate. 
dunking is more interesting. People who want to dunk on somebody else on Twitter are sincere and they are adversarial, but they are very rarely cooperative, not with the person that they are retweeting. And they're also probably not engaged in persuasion either because their audience are people who already agree with them. The point of dunking is to show off in front of people who already agree with you about how the person you disagree with is stupid and evil. And so you're probably not actually trying to persuade anyone either. So again, this is going to explain why dunking practices are not part of good faith debate. And finally, bots, because they don't have mental states, they can't be sincere, they are rarely engaged in a cooperative project, they are often not intended to persuade, they're intended to be more like trolls, they might be adversaries, but they very much are not going to look like good faith debate. Okay, so I've pulled together all these pieces. I've argued that this cooperation model, unified around this idea of cooperation, seeing uh, good faith debate as a joint project, is, is much more robust than the accounts we have so far. You'll notice on this little map I've given you at the end, I've replaced the word truth with the phrase joint doxastic project, because as we saw when we looked at the other models, it looked like orienting this too much around truth ran into some problems, problems about non-truth related topics, uh, and, and then also problems about, uh, about, um, about manipulative zealots who care only about truth and about nothing else. So this phrase joint, joint doxastic project is meant to be more general than just truth. It might be truth related, but instead it's about doxastic and is a term philosophers use having to do with making decisions, basically making up your mind. It could be about factual matters. It could be about what to do with your life. It could be collectively, politically, how we should organize ourselves. It could be a truth related project, but it doesn't have to be. It's up to the participants to figure out what the contours of the project are. Okay, so the idea is that good faith debate is respectful, it's aimed at a joint doxastic project, and that's what accommodates, that's what, that's what, um, what constitutes good faith. Okay, last part of the talk. How can we use all of this to understand what's going wrong with the internet? I've already pointed at some of the things, right? I've already pointed at trolls and that sort of stuff, but these are obvious malefactors. These are trolls who are motivated by causing hostility. They're bots who are there just to stir up garbage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my, claim, my last claim is that even people of goodwill, people who aren't trolls, who don't start off as trolls or bots or whatever, um, even people of goodwill get warped by internet culture. And I want to claim that internet culture actually bends us towards bad faith. There are structural features of internet culture, especially on social media, that promote bad faith exchanges and make them almost inevitable or make it very hard to stay in good faith. So the last part of this talk is to show these distinct contingent features of internet culture and show how they're bending us away from accomplishing, from, from, from meeting the criteria of the um, cooperation model. Start with the problems of anonymity and quantity. These are related points. The people you argue with on social media are not known to you often. They might literally be anonymous. They're behind a pseudonym or some Pepe the Frog avatar or whatever, or it's just there's just so many of them. Maybe they're using their real names like on Facebook, but you're arguing with a different person every week uh, or every day or every 10 minutes, or there's a pile on where you're seeing a whole bunch of strangers come and argue with you. The point is that often on social media that people you're arguing with are not people you know or expect to ever contact again. So what it means is that they're basically just ciphers. And that causes cause a lot of trouble for even a person of goodwill because you can't be sure they're sincere, right? So you can't be sure to what extent you're engaged in a sincere project at all. You can't know to what extent their motives are cooperative, right? And then maybe most importantly, it's very hard to correctly deploy persuasion with such a person. Because remember, remember the point from Mario Mirzakhani, what to count as persuasive, you aren't just trying to persuade some abstract entity. You're trying to persuade the actual person you're talking to, 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 to speak to what they know, what their limits are in the topic and what their limits are as far as thinking clearly about the topic. So if, if she needs to dumb it down to help me understand mathematics, that's different than if she's talking to another mathematician. And similarly, on, I, I, in contrary, on social media, you generally just don't know what the context is of the person you're trying to persuade or the audience who might be reading along with you. You just don't know. And so you might not even be able to accomplish the requirements of persuasion given anonymity and quantity. So all of these factors push against having sincerely cooperative, ever so persuasive relationships with all the people we meet on social media. Further, there's this really important problem, especially on networks like Facebook and Twitter, with network selection. And this has to do with how feeds work. 
So when I am tweeting, it goes out to my followers. And when you are tweeting, it goes out to your followers. And if we're tweeting at each other, that each of our followers are going to see it. But when I'm imagining the audience reading, I know about my audience. I know my network. I know who my followers are roughly, I'm not, not all of them, but I know roughly who they are. I might know nothing about your network. And so the audience I'm imagining in my head that I'm trying to persuade even if it were engaged in this kind of um, a, a demonstrative, ever, I forgot which term I use now, adversarial demonstration, um, we, do, we don't have the same audience. This isn't Bayard Rustin and uh, Malcolm X at Howard talking to, to the same audience known to both of them, known at least abstractly to both of them. This is instead each of us talking to a different audience. And that's a big problem because what's gonna count as appropriate persuasion to each audience might differ. And in what, when you talk to your audience, in a way that is reasonably persuasive to them, that might look to me like bad faith debate pretty easily. It's gonna look like, cause you're not talking to me, you're not talking to my audience, the one I know. It could very easily look to me like your intentions are bad, like you're trying to do something other than achieve a joint persuasive project, um, when in fact, maybe that was your intention and vice versa. And very quickly, once we start to doubt each other's capacities to engage in good faith, then we really do quit behaving in good faith. We really do just start talking to our own audiences instead. Like this is just such a problem on Twitter where people are constantly talking only to their own audience. One of my least favorite things about Twitter is the hostile quote retweet. If you're not on Twitter, you won't know what I'm talking about. If you are, you do, which is that people very often are having a debate back and forth in a comment thread, and then somebody will take your comment and retweet it back to the top of a new thread with a negative framing around it. And the whole point of doing that is to shift the debate back onto their terms, because once they retweet it, the audience is their followers. And so now the debate is happening in front of people who presume that they are right and give them a bunch of support. It's a kind of power move, which I find really distasteful and really problematic. And I think it comes out of this network selection effect. We become incentivized to shift the audience around rather than try to figure out, I mean, we kind of can't figure out who the real audience is or who the, the, the general audience might be um, and try to persuade them. And the simple way to put it, if I'm arguing with you in front of your followers, I don't know who your followers are. How am I gonna persuade them? So if I quote retweet you, now I get to decide who the audience is and that's good for me. This is not gonna to lead to good faith debate. Finally, the, the systems themselves have algorithms that amplify hostile exchanges. So this has been documented by a bunch of psychologists that if you tweet at other people with negative, uh, with morally negative emotional words, you get retweeted and shared much more. I think it's 20% for every hostile negative word you use, you get a 20% uptick in the number of retweets and, or shares you get. Um, and the reason for this is because the algorithms are intended to drive engagement. Facebook and Twitter want you to stay on as long as possible. And a great way to keep you on is to get you into a flame war because then you're motivated to come back and fight with somebody some more. This is, this is kind of baked into the way that Facebook and Twitter automatically curate what you get to see. Uh, they are trying to address this. Both companies said they want to do better on this. Twitter, I think, has done more work on this. But for the moment, it is still true that the algorithms themselves drive us into exchanges that are likely to make us angry. And anger, of course, comes a lot out of bad faith. It also causes us to engage in bad faith. So these are all ways in which the, the structure of social media itself pushes us away from good faith engagement. I think all of this comes together, this is my last main point, all of this comes together to explain a couple of examples of, of contentious debate we've seen on social media in recent months. So there's a really excellent piece. I would recommend you read it later. It's by the journalist Lily Loughborough. It was published in Slate this summer. Um, and it has to do with this big fight that took place back in June and July about whether, um, whether woke social justice warriors and newsrooms were clamping down on good faith, honest debate and, um, and cancel culture had taken over and driven out all thoughtful different disagreements and differences, right? And this, this was, there was this notorious letter published in Harper's Magazine that I think massively oversimplified this exchange and caused a huge fight. And it was a big fight about whether the letter itself was in good faith. Anyway, that's all the background. Loughborough published this piece in, shortly after that exchange, which I think was really helpful because what she did was deflate a lot of the emotional stakes of that and point out that a lot of what's going on has to do with the nature of the internet rather than the nature of these contentious social debates that were being had over the internet. So I'm just gonna read to you a couple of excerpts from this piece, which I think are pointing out something really important. So here's the first one. She says, um, add to this that on the, on the internet, 
Most arguments worth having have been had and witnessed thousands of times already on these platforms in multiple permutations. Those of us who've been here for a while know their tired choreographies, the moves and counter moves. If I see someone bring up black on black crime in response to an article about racist policing, I know how, I know how almost every step of the interaction will go should I choose to engage. Rather than learn from these exchanges, people of all persuasions on Twitter mostly enjoy the style, whichever dunk we happen to agree with. This isn't universal, of course. One can try to engage in good faith, and some people do, but given that the reward for all that effort is likely to be mockery or contempt, one learns not to bother. Black on black crime becomes a cue to sign off or lob an insult or quote retweet with a mocking meme. She continues, yes, this dynamic is very bad for discourse. Yes, it inhibits intellectual exchange. Yes, it makes productive dissensus almost impossible. But that isn't because of cancel culture or illiberalism. It's because in this discourse environment, good faith engagement is actually maladaptive. If you try to carefully explain to every single person who posts all lives matter on the internet that they shouldn't and how they might not know that it sounds racist, you'll lose your mind. Many of them know what they're saying and are doing so on purpose. The ones who do it innocently are rare. You could engage in good faith in hopes of finding the latter, but instead people do something pretty rational given the context and the volume of stuff they have to sort through. They take shortcuts, filter, classify. All lives matter equals racist. And I think the key point here, which is really perceptive, is that we've had 15 years of social media. And we've reached a point where so much social media discourse is about the discourse. It's so meta. Everything on social media is meta. It's about the standard moves people make. It's about what terms are signifiers of a standard set of moves. But the key point Lefbro is making, I think, is just it's repetitive. We see the same debates over and over and over and over and over and over again. And at a certain point, it becomes adaptive to expect there are going to be some trolls and garbage around and to just skip past the boring stuff, the boring stuff of figuring out who the trolls are and move to the meta commentary on how to manage the debate, given that we all know how the debate's going to go. And Lufbro points out, I think, really, really helpfully how to somebody who's not extremely online, all of this looks just mad. It doesn't make any sense. A lot of the shorthand looks silly. A lot of the dismissive comments aren't understood in a context of, I think you're going to be a bad faith troll. Instead, if you dismiss somebody, you look like you are the bad faith troll because et cetera, et cetera. And so people anticipate that and they counter move that by meting how to deal with the hypothetical audience member who doesn't know who knows who is a troll. And so they try to prepare for that. You know, like, if you've done this, if you've participated in these debates, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, you're exactly experiencing the problem here, is that the meta level of internet debate is just, it makes it almost impossible to have, to have the faith to engage in good faith debate with a stranger on the internet. So that's the overwhelming problem. I really wish I could give you a nice happy solution here where I'd say, how do we get back out of the point of our internet conversation being about metaing each other all the time? Um, unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm writing a book called uh, Social Media and Democracy are Incompatible. So my views are that we're in a lot of trouble, actually. I'm not so sure there is a way back out of this uh, other than trying to pull away from using social media to, as, as our means of having uh, public debate, which is, just, which is tough. It doesn't look like we're going that way. So I will end on that um, unfortunate note, but I do hope at minimum trying to articulate what good faith debate is supposed to be was a, help, was a helpful diagnosis of what the problem is, and we can at least think clearly about that. Thank you so much for listening.